Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Storm Ushery, Conservation Education Manager with the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. And today we have a special um, treat for you. We've got Bill Taylor. He is our Northwest Area Regional Wildlife Biologist, and he's going to be giving us a presentation and just be kind of talking about it's it's basically going to be an introduction to the basics of wildlife radio telemetry. So with that, I'm going to pass off the reins and let Bill um, go ahead and give his presentation today. Thank you, Storm. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share with uh, people that are interested, particularly young, young people that may be interested in getting into wildlife science, whether that's uh, one of these different professions that uh, Storm is covering and trying to introduce people to. Uh, I happen to be a wildlife biologist, and that's kind of where uh, my love uh, steered me to was to into the wildlife biologist portion of this field. So today I'm going to be talking about a tool that's widely used. Um, not, it's widely used all over the world by wildlife managers. Uh, they use a technique, it's called wildlife radio telemetry, and it's used for many purposes. And I hope to introduce people into uh, uh, kind of the basics of it, give you an intro, and then explain to you some of the techniques and uh, tips that I have that I've learned over the years. And uh, it'll get you, get you the basics of the equipment. Um, what is wildlife telemetry? Um, that's the question. It, it's a wildlife telemetry is basically uh, can be defined as the transmission of information from a transmitter which has been planted on a free, free ranging wild animal uh, to a receiver. And the receiver uh, transforms a radio signal into audio, audio, audible pulse that a biologist can use to, to hear and identify the location of that animal. And with the identification of the look, with, uh, with the knowledge of the location of the animal, Wildlife biologists are able to use this information for many things, which we will cover uh, in a future slide here. Uh, wildlife radio telemetry is also known by other names. People might call it radio tagging or radio tracking, um, but it all uses radio signals uh, from a transmitter that's been put on an animal to a receiver. And so it's all the same uh, basic or same same equipment's used for all those uh, things. Um, prior, prior to radio tracking or radio telemetry, scientists used to have to, to capture animals and mark them some way in which it didn't harm the animal so that they could be recaptured or identified from a distance with the, the mark. Take, for instance, if you marked uh, a mule deer population in a wintering area low off of a mountain. And you use different, different collars or ear tags with numbers on them to, to mark these mule deer. Uh, you could go into a, the summer areas and see where mule deer from different areas have come into. Maybe a region has uh, that you marked, that you put out yellow collars and yellow ear tags with different numbers. And then another area you put out pink and another area you put out blue. Well, scientists could go out there and see these collars and the collars or ear, ear tags, and they could identify, well, we caught that deer in this location back in the winter off of this mountain. And you could do that in different areas and they could kind of track that way. Well, that method is very uh, labor intensive. You're out there a lot and you actually have to side identify the animal. With uh, radio telemetry, you put out a known transmitter with a known frequency, and then you listen for um, the pulse, and you can identify uh, uh, the animal's location without actually having to visualize it or recapture it to identify it. So it was a big step up from the mark and recapture methods that were used prior to this method. So the first person that um, 
was credited with putting out a VHS transmitter, which is very high frequency, um, or very, yeah, VHF, very high frequency transmitter was Frank Bellrose. Uh, he used it to record a mallard duck back in the early 1960s. Um, since the 1960s, um, we've developed VHF and it's come a long way. And then starting in the early 1990s, um, the GPS was released and uh, available uh, to the public. And scientists just soon used the GPS, which is Global Positioning System, to, uh, to uh, get more accurate and precise locations of animals without involving so much labor intensive work. Uh, these uh, locations are transmitted via satellite uh, and then from the transmitter to a satellite and then back to a receiver. And they can be downloaded into uh, your computer without actually being out in the field. You can track many animals without actually being out there. So that's kind of the newest technology that scientists are using today which is GPS, and that's been more, more widely used since the 1990s. Um, purposes that, uh, what purposes can wildlife radio telemetry be used for? Um, scientists can use it for many location, and this is just a few that, that um, I have put down here. You can determine the physical location of the animal. Uh, as I discussed with that mule deer population, where is it in the summer versus where is it in the winter? You can determine what habitat um, the animals are using. Um, you can use it, if, are they selecting this area or that area? And then you can go into those areas and look at the vegetation and different components and try to determine why those animals are using those particular habitats. Um, you can, they can be programmed to detect mortality, whether the animal is dead or alive. Um, if some of them have, uh, can be programmed where if the, the uh, transmitter is not moved for a certain amount of time, whether that's two hours, four hours or longer, it'll send out a different uh, a signal. Maybe it's a faster signal um, and you can use that uh, if the, the transmitter is not moving, then you probably know maybe I need to go look at that and see if something has happened to my, my uh, animal I marked. And you can also use that to help determine what is causing mortality in the population of animals that you're studying. Um, they also can be used to detect uh, movements and patterns, uh, say a migration route. If those mule deer are moving off of a mountain, into a lower area. Um, as winter comes, you can track those areas and see where they're crossing fences and roads and in which areas, which canyons and so forth are they, is their preferred travel uh, route or travel corridor. So there's another real useful um, um, purpose that wildlife biologists can use uh, radio telemetry tracking for. Um, you can determine nesting areas for birds. Uh, when, when wintering ducks leave uh, your study area, how do they travel back to uh, their, their summer breeding grounds? Uh, you can, you can um, look at that travel movement and so forth on a migration like that as well. Um, so they're, they could be used for breeding areas. If you know uh, animals are in an area breeding, um, you can say, well, then maybe we shouldn't disturb this area. Maybe there shouldn't be a, uh, we can uh, not disturb this area in the summer or spring whenever they're, they're giving birth and, and so forth. So they can help determine where those animals are during those times. And like I said, they can be used to determine feeding areas. If you look at that habitat, you can go in there and see what those animals are using for uh, food and determine maybe we need to protect this area because this is a real critical area for these deer or elk or uh, birds uh, during the winter. We need to make sure that we have uh, ample food and that they're going to be taken care of. So there's a lot, a lot of other 
uses, but that's some of the main uses uh, that wildlife biologists use radio telemetry or tracking for. Um, there's three main components to the wildlife uh, telemetry system. The first one is the transmitter. Uh, we'll go over some different transmitters in, in a future slide, but the transmitter is what is placed on the animal that, that transmits the signal um, that you will be trying to pick up. The second main component is the radio receiver or radio, the receiver data logger. Um, it's used to, um, to amplify the signal and make it audible to you, the biologist, either through the speaker it has or through some headphones, but where you can detect the radio signal. Without the receiver, you would not be able to detect that and hear that signal. And the second thing is the, and the third thing is the antenna and the cabling that's associated with the antenna. The antenna basically catches and gathers the signal and which direction it's coming from. And then the cable transmits it to the receiver. So all those are necessary uh, for this system to work. Um, the two main types of radio tracking are uh, VHF radio tracking and GPS, and I discussed those briefly. Um, those are the two main ones that we use, very high frequency uh, and the, the global positioning system. Um, you can get collars that contain both. Um, they'll have a GPS that's, that's transmitting a signal, and it'll also have the, the ability to do uh, VHF, where you can track it in with uh, uh, your receiver and antenna if you're out in the field. And so there's so many different varieties of collars and options that uh, you have to really study it and, and to, get, to get all that's out there. They're, they're coming up with new ideas and, and bigger or smaller and better transmitters all the time, so um, it just keeps improving. Um, the transmitters um, that I have here, I have some examples of different sizes and uh, different things, uh, but they all basically have three main components to the transmitter. Um, they all have to have a power source, either uh, internal battery, or a solar cell that can, can generate the power for them. Um, they, uh, the battery is a big, big deal with these uh, transmitters because the battery is often, often the limiting uh, factor in how long that these things can live and the size, how big they are or how small they can be. So the battery size has a, a big effect and in uh, how long your transmitter is going to be out there and uh, uh, how long that it's going to be useful to you. So uh, the uh, second main thing about them is they got to have some kind of circuit board or uh, uh, frequency associated with them. So that's all in the electronics portion of it. And the third Third thing that they all have to have is an antenna that will transmit that signal to you, the biologist. Um, some of them are internal, like in this example of this little, this little pit tag here, you can see a coiled wire um, here that um, you run a, a receiver over it and it'll tell you the number and you can associate that uh, with a marked animal. There's some that are uh, used um, these will, can be pushed, put in internally or, uh, you know, in something very small. They use them a lot in fish and the vets use them a lot to, uh, on uh, dogs and stuff to, uh, there'll be a number associated with it and they can look up a dog. If it comes into a vet loss, they can scan over it and it'll, it can help reunite it with the owner. There's different ones that can be glued on adhesive ones. This is a, 
vaginal transmitter that's pushed out after an animal gives birth and it'll give the location of, of birth. And then of course there's all various sizes and configurations of collared um, transmitters. So there's just a wide variety of them. The uh, receiver is what you'll be carrying when you're actually trying to, to uh, find the transmitter. Um, the receiver is designed to, for the, uh, to pick up the transmitter signal. Uh, it has an antenna that's cabled with it to, that helps to gather the signal and the frequency uh, must match the transmitter. So not every receiver will work with every transmitter out there. It's important that you have the right uh, frequency for the transmitters that you're trying to pick up. Um, most state agencies and wildlife use a bandwidth of 148 to 152 megahertz. Uh, law enforcement and other agencies have, ha, or other entities, they have different megahertzes. So you don't want to have a whole lot of overlap in the area. Otherwise, you'll be chasing circles. So it's important that, uh, that you know the frequency and you have the receiver that matches the frequencies for the transmitters you're trying to put out. The receiver's basic job is to amplify and make the radio signal uh, audible to the biologist or the user where that they can hear it either through the external speaker that it has, or you can wear uh, headphones and listen through it through headphones. So that's the main purpose of the, the receivers to be able to pick up the, the signal and amplify it where you can hear it. Um, the, some of the receiver's main features and controls are, it has a, a the frequency controls um, in this photo here, they're, they're down here. You can program the frequency to the transmitters that, that you want. So this is very important to be able to program it where it'll pick up your target uh, frequency from the transmitter you're trying to find. They also have a gain control, which is used to strengthen or soften the signal reception so that uh, uh, the user is able to detect it uh, and sometimes you want this the signal to be very very uh, you want to reduce that signal strength when you're getting close and sometimes when you're having a hard time finding it you'll turn that gain up where uh, it amplifies that signal as strong as you can so it's important to be able to to uh, control that that uh, reception Another thing that they have is a volume control. Um, it's used in coordination with your gain control to increase or decrease the volume where um, the audible signal uh, is detectable by you. Sometimes when you're um, getting really close to an, uh, a transmitter, you'll need to turn it down really low where you can just barely hear it here and gather that signal so you can isolate it. Um, so those are two main controls that you'll be using when you're out using your receiver. Another main uh, thing you have to do is be able to turn it on and off. It has the area where you plug in your antenna and it has a headphone connection or an external speaker where you're, the, uh, the signal is audible to the user. And it's important to be able to charge it. So most of them have a recharging uh, port for an internal battery um, so you can recharge your unit before you take it out in the field. Um, there's different types of antennas. Uh, the main antennas that you use with your receiver are um, handheld directional antennas. Uh, we call uh, one style, a uh, Yagi antenna, and the other one is a H antenna. Uh, the handheld Yagis usually have between two and five elements. Each additional element helps to increase the distance from which the antenna can pick up the signal. So having an antenna with uh, five elements is going to allow the user 
to amplify and gather that signal uh, from a further, a further distance than a two element um, Yagi antenna. Uh, H antennas always just have two, two um, antennas and are shaped like an H. That's how they get their name. The uh, another um, antenna that are um, used commonly are uh, um, like boat or vehicle mounted uh, omni antennas, and they'll gather from from uh, a whole. You really can't determine the exact direction because they're gathering a big circle pattern. Basically, they're receiving from all directions. But they're useful in getting the general location of, of your target or your transmitter. And then you will generally will get out a, a, a Yagi or H antenna and determine the direction that that transmitter or target is, is uh, sending that signal from. Another type of antennas that uh, biologists will use for monitoring is though they can mount the Yogis or H antennas uh, to aircraft, and you can use these the aircraft to gather um, your signal from a um, much larger area, and it allows you to cover a large area if you have a big study site, uh, maybe in difficult terrain. Uh, using an aircraft may be a, a real good option to go in and monitor periodically. Uh, particularly if an animal gets out of uh, the area where you're not able to access it uh, via foot or vehicle or something, a lot of times it's nice to have an aircraft that has that capability. So here's some pictures of the different types of uh, antennas, the handheld directional antennas that or the Yagi, which the pictures here shows a three element Yagi. This is an aluminum based one. These uh, elements will fold back and make it more compact for traveling and so forth. Uh, this is an H style. Uh, different biologists prefer different antennas. Um, my personal preference is the, the three element Yagi. That's the one that I seem to have the best. Uh, luck with, but other people have real good success with the H. So I guess um, you just uh, personal preference as you get out there and experiment. Um, I would try both and see what you you like if, if uh, you have access to both, but they both do the same job. But generally, I just, you know, biologists will have a preference and and so uh, another one uh, that I use is the the Omni or the the vehicle antenna. I uh, usually use that when I'm uh, sweeping through an area. I'll have my uh, receiver on a scan mode where it's scanning for for different transmitters. You can program them where you the whole multiple uh, frequencies, and you can you can have an Omni uh, antenna up, and it'll It'll let you know if you're getting close enough, and then you can you can get out your directional and and uh, really figure out where it's coming from. But they're useful in that, and that's the main thing that I uh, use the Omni for. Uh, and as I just talked about earlier, here's a picture of an aircraft, and uh, they're hard to see, but under the wings there's um, two. Um, H style directional antennas attached to this aircraft and the pilot will use a toggle switch and he can move from left to right and he can detect the direction of the uh, transmitter. Uh, and this is very useful in difficult terrain or if you need to cover a wide area uh, in, in a short amount of time, the aircraft is very useful. This is kind of the basic um, schematic of how a handheld receiver would, would work or is set up. Um, you have your antenna, which is connected with the coaxial cable to a receiver. 
and there's different types of receivers as we that picture illustrated earlier. Uh, but you have to have a antenna with a cable, and then you need to have a speaker of some si sort, whether that's your headphone or your external uh, speaker that's built into your receiver. You have to have some way of to be able to to hear that signal. Um, and so you'll have to have some kind of speaker. So uh, this is what you need to go out and find a, a transmitter is a system similar to this that's programmed to the correct uh, megahertz for the transmitters you're trying to find. There's two main methods that biologists use to, to um, track or find uh, animals and transmitters. The first one is called triangulate. And that's basically when a biologist will listen for a signal and they will gather the bearings from multiple locations. Uh, usually you'll take it from two or three different locations and then you'll estimate where the, you'll take a line from each of those locations and then you'll estimate where those um, lines intersect. And that'll give you a pretty good idea of where that animal is. Uh, and then you can head into that area and, and look for it there, or that might be good enough for what you're doing. Uh, you, could, you could map that and say, you know, the animal's in this area at this time. Uh, sometimes you have to get closer and get a visual. And, and then if you need that kind of information, then you would generally we would track it or you would home into it. And when you need that kind of information, the, uh, the tracking is the other method that biologists would use. And the biologists would track that to the, to the animal. What you do is you, um, you listen to your, to your receiver and you try to determine the loudest, clearest, uh, strongest beep, and then you um, will start in that direction. And as you get closer, you'll have to constantly turn down the volume and the, the gain control to lessen that signal so you can keep isolating where that signal's coming from. As you get closer, that signal will seem like it's a wider and wider path. So it's important to be able to use those gain and volume controls to isolate that signal. And you also use your antenna. Uh, you'll continue to sweep that. Um, you can turn it both vertically and horizontally, and you'll, you'll, you'll be sweeping that area and you're listening. It, you wanna travel slow and uh, continue monitoring that and isolating and heading towards the the loudest, clearest, strongest signal, and eventually you'll you'll get on top of their your transmitter or animal. You'll have a visual of it. So uh, it's important that you go slow and that you often check behind you uh, if a transmitter has fallen off of an animal or is covered. Uh, you could very well go past it, and and so you need to sweep behind yourself and make sure that you haven't passed that transmitter as you're out there looking. Um, there's the two different transmitters, the VHS tran VHF transmitter. Uh, there's some advantages and disadvantages to it. Um, the advantages are it's usually relatively low cost compared to the GPS transmitter. Um, they have a reasonable accuracy for most purposes. Um, they usually have a little longer battery life. Um, it can be programmed to just come on for several hours a day. Uh, maybe you'll have it where it just comes on during the daylight hours if you're studying an animal or you're going to be out in the field in the daylight or you can program it where it'll come in, come on at, during the evening hours or night hours. Um, you can have them where they're programmed where they'll come on for four hours or eight hours or, or 12 hours. They're, they have a lot of uh, variables that can be uh, 
programmed into them that will help aid in that battery life. Um, they're generally easy to learn. Um, uh, it takes practice and experience, but as you learn it and listen to them, uh, it doesn't take long and you'll get the hang of it. Um, the pulse sig pulse can be programmed, as I said, to come on at different hours. It can be used to detect if the animal has moved or not moved, which is important when you're detecting mortality and looking for mortality. Uh, often they'll have them programmed where after four hours of inactivity, it'll go into a faster pulse, which we call a mortality pulse. It'll go to basically maybe from one beep a second to two beeps a second uh, is, a, is a common feature that you'll find in the VHF transmitters. Um, and as I said, it can be mounted and used in uh, vehicles, on aircraft, handheld. There's a wide range of ways to receive and, and track a VHF transmitter. The disadvantages are is that uh, they're generally very labor intensive. You have to be out in the field uh, gathering these readings. Um, uh, and, they're, and a lot of times being out in the field, you are dependent upon weather, um, you know, into a travel study area. Your travel study area is often going to be away from urban areas and, and uh, maybe out on dirt roads or there might not be any roads. It might be in a wilderness setting where access is very limited. And it's often hard to uh, get in and, and monitor these areas, get access. It could be covered in snow or rain and cause the roads to be muddy if there is roads. So uh, that's often a, one of the disadvantages of having to go out and, and physically monitor the VHF transmitters. Um, also, if you're using the, the aircraft, uh, if you have access to aircraft, the weather can prohibit it from flying if there's bad weather, windy weather. Um, it can clouds, different things can can hemp stop the uh, aircraft from being able to get up in the air and fly and monitor for you. Um, the GPS is, like I said, is a, a newer technology. Some of the the uh, disadvantages with it is it has a higher cost compared to VHF transmitters. Um, the, the GPS transmitters are often uh, much more expensive depending on what kind of features you have on them. Um, the transmitters tend to be larger in size. They usually have a larger size battery uh, associated with them um, that's needed to transmit the signals and information from the transmitter up to the satellite. So they're usually heavier and larger in size. And oftentimes the uh, short, they have a shorter battery life because of the extra need and the extra power needed for uh, the transmission of the signals to the satellite. So, but some of the advantages of them are is that they're highly accurate. Um, they can give you pinpoint locations and uh, uh, you can get multiple locations versus if you're going out in the field, you might be going out there and getting the location of your animal once or twice a week, uh, once a month maybe uh, with the VHF transmitter. And with the GPS, you could have that thing send you the location, uh, you know, twice a day. Uh, four times a day. Uh, if you needed it, they could probably get it to you every hour. So it depends on what you're studying and, and how many points you need. But uh, GPS are able to gather a huge amount of uh, information and give you exact locations um, multiple times a day if needed. Um, the data can be transmitted or stored in the trans transmitter. Um, some of them, you can just have the the GPS caller store and hold all those locations for you, or a lot of them can transmit it and send it to a satellite and then they can send it 
to your laptop or your computer where you can view it and uh, and look at it uh, without being out in the field. So um, that's a, a nice advantage of them. Uh, they're very good in remote locations, like I discussed earlier, if you're in a wilderness setting or someplace with limited access, very rough terrain, uh, GPS might be a uh, higher cost initially, but you'll, you'll uh, find that it, it's, uh, you know, saves you money in the long run as far as trying to get out there and monitor it and the ease of getting out there and getting your data. So um, yeah, you can access your, your data day or night uh, when you need it. Uh, that's a very nice feature of them. And uh, they're coming out with more smaller and uh, GPS transmitters all the time. Uh, some have solar cells. Um, this is our, our New Mexico Department of Game and Fish waterfowl biologist, and he's doing a pintail study. And this was the smallest uh, uh, GPS transmitter that I've associated and had dealings with. This is a female pintail uh, duck that he, he put this solar powered transmitter on and he's monitoring uh, how they fly from, from this wintering area in New Mexico back up to their, their summer breeding areas up north uh, by Wisconsin or Montana or, or where they're going. But uh, he's monitoring that. And uh, this is him applying one with a, a backpack system and uh, super gluing the ends where they will not, uh, this, the elastic cannot come undone. So. Uh, they're getting smaller and smaller, and uh, yeah, this is an example of a, a solar-powered GPS transmitter that uh, that's out, you know, uh, uh, out in the field right now. Uh, there's several things that a biologist could should consider when selecting a transmitter. Uh, you need to consider what your goals are of your project that you're doing? How frequent do you need to monitor that animal's location? Um, the data requirements of the project, how long is it gonna last? Is it gonna be a few months or several year project? Um, you gotta consider the safety to the animal. Um, you know, you gotta consider if you're putting that on a young animal, is it gonna grow and its neck expand if you're putting on collars or uh, you wanna take those kind of considerations. You don't wanna put out uh, collars that are going to, or a transmitter that's going to harm the animal. So you got to consider that everything that that animal is doing. Um, you got to consider their behavior. Uh, a lot of animals like mule deer or deer species, sheep, elk, uh, their necks will grow and expand during the breeding season. So you have to, if you put that out in the summer, uh, you want to make sure that you leave enough room as in the fall and winter, whenever they're in their breeding season, that their necks will have room to expand without choking them. So you have to consider things like that before you place out your collars. You also want to consider the size of the animal, uh, what, how big of a, a transmitter can you put on it? Um, larger animals, of course, like this elephant, you can put a much bigger transmitter than you can an insect and, or, or a bear. So uh, you have to consider uh, things like that. Typically, you don't want your transmitter to be no more than 5% of the animal's body weight. So uh, the smaller the transmitter that you can get away with and get your study done successfully, the, the less invasive it is to that animal, the better off it is for that animal. You have to consider the cost of the transmitters. You might want the latest and greatest GPS collar, but um, it's not within the budget of the project. So you often have to consider cost as well. Um, you want to look and see what has worked successfully in the past. You'll want to research the literature and see what other researchers are using the size and what has worked and hasn't worked. And you want to spend some time before you put out a transmitter researching 
what is a good option for you. You can talk to the <coughs> to the representatives of the manufacturers and see what they recommend and what what uh, they know has worked in in uh, maybe some of the latest options they have. Um, some tick tips and tricks that I would uh, uh, share with you and, and encourage you is uh, when you start into radio uh, tracking, um, it's, you're going to find that this, this instruction or any kind of instruction is not going to provide you with what you can gather when you're out there doing a hands-on practice. Um, it's really something that you have to get out there and practice and do. I can't explain it uh, to the detail that would would make you uh, well skilled in this in this uh, practice. You'll you'll have to get out there and actually it's something you have to get out there and just uh, learn and practice and you to develop the skill well. Um, it's a good idea to have an experienced person show you how to adjust the receiver and what they're doing when they adjust it. Uh, this will help you a whole lot if they explain uh, what they're doing and which knobs they're turning and why they're turning them. Uh, that's a good way to, to, to learn uh, how to use a receiver and track in on a transmitter. Um, you can't be afraid to adjust the knobs. You can't just set it and start. Um, you'll be adjusting those knobs constantly as you walk. Um, or tracking in, and so you'll have to have to know what the knobs are and what they do, and uh, you can't be afraid to adjust them as you're as you're trying to find your target or transmitter. Um, oftentimes, you'll even move the frequency off of your known target as you get closer to it. Sometimes you'll move the the uh, target. At, for an example, if you had a transmitter that's one five zero point one one five you might lower that a little bit or raise it a little bit as you move in uh, to lessen that signal intensity. And that'll help you to isolate and gather where that point. So um, it's important to know your, your um, frequency, but sometimes you'll move it off of it intentionally in order to uh, lessen the strength of that signal so you can home in or track into it and get a real precision area sometimes it gets too loud and you just have to uh, keep trying to figure out ways to adjust it and lessen that signal where you can pinpoint it another good thing to do uh, if you're beginning to uh, in into radio telemetry is a uh, practice a hide and seek with a, a transmitter um, you would have someone hide it from you in an area where you don't know, and then just practice uh, homing in on it. You can use that to try your triangulation. Uh, tri triangulation. Um, you can see how close you can get um, by taking three or four points and, and mark an area and then see how close you are once you know it. Or you can also use that to pinpoint your uh, and walk in and track or home into your transmitter. Um, you want to start off with the location that's easy to see <clears throat> and and easy to find, and then have it have them get more and more uh, difficult when they hide the transmitter. Um, eventually, they can hide it under leaves or brush or even uh, under soil a couple inches and you try to home in and find that, that transmitter. Uh, remember sometimes that those transmitters are gonna be hidden and uh, hard to find uh, once they're off the animal. The, some of the transmitters, they have breakaways. Uh, as we discussed, sometimes the animal is uh, uh, has been been uh, predated on and and the uh, uh, coyote or something will cache the head or the ear where the transmitter is and its lump will be hidden under a brush, dirt. Um, we've had 
animals carry them up into trees. The, the ears of uh, young elk calves have been up in nesting, um, crow's nest and things like that. So uh, you have to be able to, uh, sometimes you'll end up having, be on your knees and, and digging in dirt, trying to find a transmitter. And sometimes they're under a bunch of snow. So the closer you can pinpoint that, that area, the less disturbance you're going to have to do to soil or uh, digging up snow or something like that to find your transmitter. So it's important to be able to really hone, home in and uh, pinpoint that transmitter as you, as you uh, get in those areas where they're more and more difficult to see. So that's something to keep in mind. You, it's surprising where you'll find these transmitters sometimes. Um, oftentimes, if you have a, a transmitter that has been buried or underneath brush or dirt or snow, soil, things like that, you can remove the, the big uh, H antenna or your, your Yagi antenna and just use the coaxial cable. And that'll lessen your signal when you're really down there. You can sweep that over, over uh, disturbed soil and so forth. And that'll often help you find a uh, transmitter that's really hard to find. Uh, one thing that I think everybody kind of struggles with or uh, uh, is difficult is balance. Um, you'll find that balance is uh, generally in mountainous terrain or, or steep box canyons where the, you have a transmitter down there and it's eliminating a, a signal, but it's hitting steep hard rock walls or uh, rocky mountains and it's bouncing the signal to another area and it's bouncing it. So that's something where you have to really adjust your, your gain down low to the lowest setting possible. And uh, a lot of times that might be an area where you want to use headphones. Uh, sometimes it's easier to get out of that area and do your triangulation from different points and try to home in on the, uh, or try to, to mark those bearings of where they intersect and then come back into that area and then, then track in on, uh, on your animal or uh, uh, transmitter. And so uh, balance is something that uh, it takes, takes a, lot of, uh, a lot of experience and use. It, it's something that frustrates everybody is a bounce chasing a signal and it's, it's emitting from someplace and then bouncing off of another surface. So that takes some experience to get, get that down. Um, if you're having a difficult time finding transmitters, uh, don't be afraid to ask for assistance from other uh, biologists or other people that have experience in it. Um, a lot of times that's a good way to help. They'll, they'll help you determine what you need or, um, you know, uh, they'll save you, save you a lot of uh, frustration uh, if you can get, get some assistance sometimes. Uh, and the more you use the receiver, the easier it will become for you to find your target. You'll be able to find transmi transmitters or your targets uh, much easier and quicker with the more experience and the more, more use you have using your receiver and antennas and, and your controls. So it does get easier the more you use it. So that's where that practice and, and use will uh, definitely aid you. And as you um, use it more, you'll definitely get better. So my summary today would be uh, radio tracking is a very useful tool that's available to biologists. Um, radio tracking can be used to study a wide range of wildlife behaviors, movements, and preferences. Um, the three main components of the system are the transmitter, the receiver, and the antenna. And um, the best thing is to try to practice and gain your skills prior to your deployment of your transmitters if you're on a project. 
uh, get familiar with your equipment before you start, before you have to use it. <clears throat> and the last thing is, as we discussed, is tracking becomes much easier with additional experience. So, so don't get discouraged if you struggle at first. The more you use it, the better you'll get. And uh, in the end, you'll, you'll enjoy, enjoy using this tool very much.